Hey everyone, Evan Damerel here, co-host of Locked On Cavs. I'm going solo today to give you, the listener, an update on Ricky Rubio's injury and also talk about tonight's game against the Indiana Pacers with the Cleveland Cavaliers. And in the final segment, we'll also be touching base on how the Cleveland Charge did over in Las Vegas as well as their Wednesday night season opening loss to the Grand Rapids Gold. But before we get started, thanks again for making Locked On Cavs your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. You are Locked On Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. Hey everyone, again, this is Evan Dabron here going solo without my co-host Chris Manning and let's talk about the Spanish sensation Ricky Rubio. For those who may not know or may not keep a calendar or are not as obsessed with this team as I am, um, we are now a year and one day removed since Ricky Rubio went down, tearing his ACL in his left knee for the second time against the New Orleans Pelicans. So when Rubio came back this offseason, it was a pretty pleasant surprise for the fans because he was, to be frank, sensational this last season for the Cleveland Cavaliers, and he was a huge factor in making Darius Garland grow and also just making Kevin Love and Jetty Osmond reliable bench threats. And I think when you look at this Cavs team now, it is clear they need some type of bench production, and getting Rubio back will help with that in any way, shape, or form. But full disclosure, J.B. Bickerstaff did make it clear early on during the recovery process whether or not we'd see the same Rubio again, and he said, we might. I mean, I I agree. It's certainly plausible, but Bickerstaff also made it clear that Rubio will never play 30 to 35 minutes a game for the Cavs again, which I think, again, as a guy who is in his early 30s, has torn the same ACL twice, has a litany of injury history and just, you know, a, a long medical rap sheet in general. It's the best way to go about things for Rubio, especially because if you're Cleveland... You didn't just sign him for this season. You signed him for this season, next season, and yes, the third season has a clause in his contract where the Cavs can make him a little bit more easy to move, but obviously we'll cross that bridge when we come to it, and uh, not we, the Cleveland Cavaliers front office will cross this bridge when we come from it, but what am I talking about? But Rubio is just kind of a player who is needed by the Cavs right now. Like Kevin Love hasn't been consistent off the bench. Jetty Osmond has had peaks and valleys, even though Fear the Sword Zone, Jackson Flickinger likes to remind everyone how impactful Jetty has been on the offense offensive side of the ball and if he gets more minutes it leads to wins yada yada so on and so forth but the Cavs have had kind of something working really well with splitting minutes between Darius Garland and Donovan Mitchell and letting one of those two be the primary point guard but I think you need that secondary offensive creation that secondary shot creation a guy who is frankly going to be looking to get his teammates more involved and get his own buckets in Rubio and also kind of missing that bigger guard that Rubio plays as even though Size wise, if you look at his height, it doesn't make sense. But when you watch Rubio play, he plays a lot bigger. But I've been I've been keeping you guys around for this a little bit too long now. But JB Bickerstaff did say earlier in the week, uh, right after the holidays. So Merry Christmas, Cavs fans, that the ideal path for Ricky Rubio coming back to the floor is the first week of the new year, which is next week. And that would mean that Rubio is on track to play either. Monday, January 2nd against the Chicago Bulls or the following game on Wednesday against the Phoenix Suns. And if you had to pick, you probably would pick the Bulls to have Rubio come back against because the Suns feels like a bit of an unfair expectation. But in the meanwhile, I mean, Rubio said during his preseason media availability that he wishes he could come back to the floor sooner. He said he wishes he could back and be back in November. But he worked with his doctors, the Cavs doctors, to make sure that he is fully healthy and he's able to come back to the floor properly for Cleveland. And I had the chance to talk with Cleveland Charge head coach Mike Garrity because J.B. Bickerstaff had mentioned to me several times that Rubio would be rehabbing with a charge when the team is on the road and just trying to get him those extra in-game reps and everything. And Rubio has practiced several times when Garrity shared this with me that he has looked better. I mean, it, obviously, it's a, it's a slow recovery process, but you see the mind is still there is what Garrity said. He was more so coaching players a lot and just giving them advice on where to be in the right spots to start things out during his recovery process. But then eventually, slowly but surely, he started working up against like Chandler Vodger and Isaiah Mobley. Um, Mama Didi Akite defended him at times. Um, even Dylan Windler, who was rehabbing his own injury, spent a lot of time defending Rubio, whether it was after Cavs shoot around or practice or just in practice with the charge in general. So 
So it's nice to see Cleveland using their G League affiliate to help rehab and recover some of their key players. But the fact that he is coming back in early January is a pretty welcome sign for Cleveland. And I would give folks the full disclosure that this also isn't going to be like an immediate fix the every single issue the Cavs are dealing with in terms of their bench production. It's it's going to be a gradual process. Um, as someone who's torn his ACL, PCL, MCL, and meniscus all at the same time, it is a gradual, gradual process to finally f- feel right physically on the floor. And I think the first five, six, maybe even ten games, Rubio is going to have to really trust himself physically because mentally there's going to be a lot of roadblocks he has to clear because when you're playing live ball or you're playing any live sport or anything like that, your instant reaction is just go into your shell and be defensive when that happens. So it'll be interesting to watch to see how Ricky performs out there. I think he will be ideally on a minutes restriction for the first handful of games and bigger staff will slowly ease him back into the rotation and everything else. But it's certainly encouraging to see that he's back and the Cavs are kind of getting back to full health. I mean, I know Dylan Windler is still injured. I know Dean Wade is, according to Bickerstaff, at least Dean Wade is progressing slowly from his shoulder injury. So there may not be a quick path for him to return to the floor either. But it's at least encouraging to say that the Cavs are finally getting a full, clean bill of health. And I had asked Bickerstaff about this. Like, is it a tough conversation to tell guys like, hey, you've been playing really well for us because guys are injured, but these guys that are injured are back and we have to kind of pull your minutes back. And JV said it's always a hard conversation, but I think this team has a mutual understanding that the Cavs are going to do what's best for them as an organization and as a team just to make sure that they aren't hurting anyone and they're also maximizing their opportunities to win games and if you're Cleveland after two kind of frustrating losses to the Brooklyn Nets and the Toronto Raptors to kind of bookend your holiday season you're looking ahead of this game against Indiana which we'll talk about in the next segment and just hoping you can kind of build some positive momentum so it's a little easier for Rubio to get back on the floor and just to make him feel a little bit more comfortable out there because the Cavs aren't kind of second guessing themselves or maybe just kind of spiraling out of control and trying to find something that can balance them out a little bit. I'm not saying they're at that point, but clearly this is a flawed Cavs team. Uh, We'll talk about this more closer to the trade deadline, but like Ricky Rubio is going to unlock a lot and I think it's going to help Darius Garland a lot just because you're not going to ask him to play so many minutes. It's going to help Donovan Mitchell a ton because Donovan Mitchell is pretty close to a lead leader and minute leader for in minutes per game this season so we'll we'll see how this goes but more than anything i think again rubio is going to kind of bring that balance to jetty osman and kevin love because last season we talked about this a lot last season on the show if you're a regular listener but kevin love was the sixth man of the year candidate for the Cavs at the end of the season but if ricky rubio was healthy it would have been ricky rubio who was the sixth man of the year candidate because Rubio by proxy got Kevin Love going and got Jetty Osmond going off the bench. And like if the Cavs can have two reliable shooting threats off the bench, it helps mitigate a lot of the shooting issues they have when they play Lamar Stevens and Evan Mobley together or Isaac Okoro, Lamar Stevens and Evan Mobley together. If you're able to sprinkle in some shooting and pepper it in here and there, it makes things a whole lot easier easier if you're the Cavaliers on the offensive side of the ball, which is definitely something you need to be focused on if you're Cleveland. But that's all there really is to talk about for Ricky Rubio right now. We'll definitely keep our eyes open and wait to see if there's any more updates. But folks, make sure you just kind of circle the Chicago Bulls game or you circle that Phoenix Suns game at home for the Cavs because one of those two will be Ricky Rubio's long away to return to the floor. and It'll be more than welcome. But we're going to take a quick break. And first, I'm going to give you a quick word from today's first sponsor, Prize picks. As I said before, today's episode of Locked On Cavs is brought to you by Prize Picks. If you want to play, pick two to five players, and if they go score more or less than their Prize Picks projection, you can win up to 10 times your money on any entry. There's no competing against other people, it's just you versus the projections available. Prize Picks offers projections on any sport that you watch that includes NBA, NFL, MLB, NHL, PGA, college football, men's college basketball, women's college hoops, soccer, WNBA, esports, NASCAR, tennis, MMA, boxing, disc golf, Euro basketball cricket and so much more i had to cut this list short just because of the time entries can be made in 60 seconds or less it's that easy they offer safe and fast withdrawals and they're currently operational in over 30 states and canada if you want to check it out download the prize picks app today or go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports first time users can receive a hundred percent instant match deposit match up to one hundred dollars with promo code locked on if you deposit one hundred dollars prize fix will give you a hundred dollars if you deposit fifty dollars prize fix will give you fifty bucks do not forget to enter promo code locked on to sign up for an instant deposit match of up to $100. 
Welcome back to Locked On Cavs, the only Cleveland Cavaliers podcast in the top 200 for Apple Podcasts. So thank you again for keeping that streak alive by making it your first listen every single day. For your second listen, make sure to check out Locked On Sports today. The biggest stories around the sports world in 20 minutes or less, plus instant reactions, game recaps, and Locked On's take of the day. Locked On Sports today, available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts, probably the same spot you're listening to the show right now. Folks, the Cleveland Cavaliers are in Nap City, Indianapolis, my least favorite city in the lower 48 of the United States. Uh, I'll tell you about that, and maybe if we had a Patreon, I'd explain more, but you get it if you've been to Indianapolis. The Cavs play the Pacers tonight, and this is a team Cleveland kind of struggled with against when they last played them. I mean, granted, the Cavs did win 118-112 to 112 13 days ago at Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse, but the Cavs really struggled with the Pacers' just sense of speed and everything else that the Cavs just kind of play, or the, sorry, excuse me, that the Pacers kind of play with because Cleveland, statistically speaking, is one of the slowest teams pace-wise in the NBA, much to Jetty Osmond's surprise because he thought Dallas was slower to them overall. But in that last game, you saw a lot of damage come from Benedict Matherin. He was 7-16 from the floor with 22 points, 3 rebounds, 2 assists. And also Tyrese Halliburton had 17-14. and 14. Buddy Heald had 14-5. and 5. Miles Turner had 12-11. and 11. The Pacers are just a fun Lee, not funly, just a very fun team in terms of youth. And like, I don't know if Rick Carlisle is having a fun time, but like this Pacers team is kind of primed to be in a sweet spot coming forward. And if they blow it up, they'll have more picks and they can build around Halliburton and Matherin. It's just a fun duo. And if you're Cleveland, you want to try and force the Pacers to play a little bit slower in the half court because that's where Cleveland thrives the most just because they play with two bigs like Evan Mobley and Jared Allen or also including Kevin Love in that mix and Robin Lopez who's questionable for this game could be in the mix as well but I think the only like saving grace from that kind of closely contested win over the Pacers is when Cleveland had to host Dallas the uh, the other night after that like the, the Cavs played with a little bit of a sense of urgency they played with a sense of pace I think they unlocked a lot of things and you saw Karis LeVert being more effective downhill. You saw Donovan Mitchell being more effective downhill. You saw Jetty Osmond really work as a facilitator, and Isaac Hora will kind of work in just those fast break scenarios too. Like there's depth and dimension. The Cavs kind of showing adaptability and playing to their strengths and also mitigating some of their weaknesses that could kind of come in handy against Indiana. And this could be a very closely contested game. I know the Pacers currently are not the best team in the Eastern Conference. They're 18 and 17, so they're third place in the Central Division, right behind Cleveland in the grand scheme of things, but the Cavs have a pretty decent lead at that point. But I still think this is going to be a pretty interesting matchup for the Cavs, and especially because Tyrese Halliburton and more so Benedict Matherin got in the face of Donovan Mitchell towards the end of the game. There was a bit of a dust-up just because these teams were kind of going at it. They are playing physically. They are playing hard. And I think the Cavs, excuse me when I sip my coffee, I think the Cavs, more than anything, were just frustrated with the fact that they know they're better than the Pacers. They know that this is a team that they should not be struggling against. They know that this is a team that they should be able to handle business against and win. But Indiana gave them their best shot. And if it wasn't for Donovan Mitchell scoring 41 points, going 8 of 15 from three-point range, Cleveland could have realistically lost this game. Darius Garland was mostly passive for the beginning of this game and until about the fourth quarter, which... I guess is encouraging if you want your franchise point guard to more so be focused on getting everyone else involved, but you got nothing from Lamar Stevens in this game against Indiana. Evan Mobley, who was really great in this one, had 16 and 9 on 6 of 10 shooting, but Jared Allen was kind of a non factor and frustrated with the Pacers just playing with size and physicality overall. So it'll be an interesting game to see what happens. I think my key matchup for this game in general is just the fact that it's going to be Benedict Matherin versus Donovan Mitchell. They did those leading score for Indiana in the last game. This is the leading score for Cleveland in that last game. And also Donovan Mitchell is arguably the most important player on the Cavs right now that we have to see what will happen next between Indiana and Cleveland. If, I were a betting man, and since it's not legal in Ohio quite yet, but it will be in three days' time, I I would put some money down on the Cavs regardless of just how this game goes. Let's see how the Pacers are doing health-wise in the grand scheme of things. But 
Right now, it just looks like Tyrese Halliburton's day-to-day, and if he does play, but you're going to see the Pacers, just a very healthy Pacers squad, give the Cavs their best shot. The Cavs team is still kind of finding themselves a little bit after kind of two ugly losses before and after Christmas, and then just trying to kind of figure out, like, where do we stand in the grand scheme of things? Where Are we good enough to hang with some of the best teams in the NBA? Like, whether it's the Toronto Raptors, who the Cavs are now 0-3 against, so the Brooklyn Nets, who have now won 10 in a row since... We, they last played Cleveland, and they won a game last night is what I'm trying to say. But they have beaten teams like Milwaukee. They handle business against the Jazz. They beat the Mavericks by one point, but they beat the Mavericks twice in a kind of pseudo playoff series. They do beat the Pacers in between that, but like the Cavs kind of have this propensity to play down to lesser opponents, whether it's the Spurs when they lost 112-111. to It required a furious charge when the Cavs get back at that one. Whether it was against like the Timberwolves, who should be better on paper but aren't a great team just because no one really likes each other on that roster or you have teams like the Clippers who were just like a little bit up and down and the Cavs struggled against them or like just that West Coast road trip between the Clippers and then they come home real quick to play the Wolves but they lose five in a row in that span like this Cavs team's a little bit up and down I think they're still flawed I still think they're trying to find themselves a little bit on the offensive side of the ball especially between Garland and Mitchell I think that's just going to be a work in progress no matter what this entire season and we may not really see this click until about 50 games into the year but this should be a fun game either way I think this is a good scope and a good lens to look at how the grand standings of the Eastern Conference may look for years to come because Cleveland is currently the team that is the the, the team to beat for the future prospects alongside Milwaukee maybe but like it's kind of refreshing to see like small market teams like Milwaukee, like Cleveland, eventually Indiana as well, just become like a bit of the powerhouses in the Eastern Conference and could be representatives for the East in the NBA Finals for years to come. But we'll talk about more about that on tomorrow's show when either I go solo or my co-host Chris Manning joins me to recap everything. But again, we're going to, have to take another quick break as I give you another word from today's other sponsor, Bet Online. Today's show is brought to you by Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there. From pro football to college football season to basketball and everything else that is going on in the sports world, they have it all. For example, the Cavs are currently plus 2,000 to win the NBA championship this season and plus 850 to win the Eastern Conference. In the NBA draft sphere, Victor Wimbignana is the, the by and far favorite to be picked first or all overall with minus 1,000 against anyone else being listed at plus 825 if you want to throw a couple hundred bucks my way and i somehow get picked first overall by let's just say the oklahoma city thunder the houston rockets or the detroit pistons I'll give you part of my rookie scale contract to pay you back for winning that bet. Bet Online will also have game lineups for the upcoming games as well, including Cavs Pacers on tonight's game. If you love sports podcasts, you can find those at Bet Online as well. They're always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet Online, where the game starts. Welcome back, everyone, to Locked on Cavs. I am Evan Damerell. Again, I'm going solo without my co-host, Chris Manning. But, folks, for this last segment, since we are in a little bit of a dry spell, since the Cavs have had some downtime during the holidays and everything else, and they're back tonight against the Indiana Pacers, let's touch on their G League affiliate, the Cleveland Charge. We talked about them a little bit in the first segment, and we know that Ricky Rubio has been rehabbing with them. We know that Isaiah Mobley and Mavadi Diakite is spending most of their time with them developing, but... The Charge certainly made some noise out in Vegas uh, over the holiday season because for the first half of the season, the Charge played, I believe, 16 to 17 games, and they were the seventh seed in the annual G League Winter Showcase Cup, which I believe is just a test run for the NBA to figure out their own midseason tournament, and it's been wildly successful for the G League, and I think they figured out a lot of the kinks, and now they're going to apply it to the NBA next year. Regardless, the Charge were able to beat this, the Atlanta Hawks affili- affiliate first, the College Park Skyhawks in the first round, but then they fell to the Windy City Bulls due to the Elam rule and Isaiah Mobley splitting two free throws in the grand scheme of things. But speaking of Mobley, he was outright sensational down in Vegas, or over in Vegas, I should say, rather. But in the first game, he had almost a triple-double with points, rebounds, and assists. And then in the second game against Windy City, he almost had a quadruple-double with points, rebounds, assists, and blocks, which is just absolutely bonkers to think about. And Diakite was no slouch either. He 
didn't get any honors in terms of the grand scheme of things at the G League Showcase Winter Cup, but he still looked pretty great out there. And I think the Cavs, if you're looking at this and you're looking at how this roster stands post-trade deadline, maybe if you still have that open roster spot, you keep Mobley on the two-way deal <clears throat> just because I believe he's in that weird spot Mobley is where he's maybe too good to be playing the G League on a night-to-night basis, but still needs those development reps and opportunities because physically he's not quite ready to handle the grind of an NBA season or just be able to play reliable spot minutes as a backup to Jared Allen and Evan Mobley and even Kevin Love, which he mentioned he kind of wants to be doing and the long term for his career with Cleveland. But instead, you convert Mamadi Diakite, you give him that last roster spot, you structure his contract, as we like to call it, a Kobe Altman special, where he gets a certain amount of money up front, but then the remaining years on the deal are non-guaranteed, and the Cavs can just either decide to opt in and keep him, use him as a trade chip in that regard, or they just let him walk in free agency and move on and use that roster spot on someone else. And also use that open two-way spot on a guy like Sharif Cooper, who has been playing really, really well for the Charge as of late. Like, during the G League Winter Showcase, he was a constant threat. I don't believe he got... No, he did not get first team all G League honors in that game. But either way, Sharif Cooper has been sensational for the Charge this season. His general stats across the table, just in 17 games for the Charge, he's averaging 22 points, 9 assists... Um, and for the, t- that's, that's actually really good. Cause he's only played one game so far for the charge, but on a game by game basis, let's just say, let's, let's go back to the Windy city bulls game where the charge lost. Sharif Cooper had 10 points, eight assists against the college park St- Skyhawks in the G league cup. He had 25 points and seven assists and a steal from the, in the game. I think with Cooper, you're noticing still some of his struggles in terms of a th- three-point shooting like he's only hitting on about 39.6 percent of his three-point shots this year but there is something there and I know Ricky Rubio is going to be returning to the floor soon and I know Ricky Rubio is on a hypothetical three-year contract with Cleveland with this being the first year of that deal but the Cavs do need to start planning for some type of contingency plan for what happens when Rubio's kind of aged out by the rest of this rotation. The Cavs have done a very good job utilizing the charge and two-way deals as of late to develop some talent. Like, you know, Dean Wade, he spent a lot of time with the charge. Jetty Osmond spent a lot of time with the charge when they're down in Canton in LeBron's last season with Cleveland. Uh, Lamar Stevens was on a two-way deal, never went to the charge, but it was another in-house development project the Cavs worked on. But those are names that have kind of back-ended and bolstered this rotation for Cleveland and their quality depth. And I think if you look at Isaiah Mobley, I think his pedigree is maybe a step up above quality depth but he's just going to be a nice depth rotation piece for Cleveland but he needs more time to grow and develop and I think that's how you utilize the charge but if you're looking at just again this through the lens of what Ricky Rubio is and what he provides to Cleveland at the grand scheme of things right now yeah right now he gives you your backup point guard needs I think getting Donovan Mitchell does mitigate a lot of this just need for a backup point but I think you need reliable depth I think you need a guy who's comfortable getting his own shot and believe you me Sharif Cooper is very comfortable getting his own shot but he's also functional as a player where I talked with Mike Garrity about this after their loss to the Grand Rapids Gold on Tuesday night that Cooper was still looking to get his teammates involved in the shots not falling and I think that's a sign of growth and maturity from Cooper and I think that's an encouraging thing if you're Cleveland because that's how the Cavs play like they want them to play kind of basketball socialism play a little bit unselfishly at times on the floor for the Cavaliers just because there's going to be nights where your shots not falling so lean on your teammates to get the job done for you and if you're Sharif Cooper and with how well he's been playing this season again his actual average is in front of me now. He's averaging 24.5 points per game, eight assists. Like, that's really, really good numbers. And if you're the Cavs, he's not stuck to your roster whatsoever. Any NBA team could swoop in and pick him up. But with it kind of being the pre-calm before the storm leading up to the trade deadline, I think you have a bit of a window if you're Cleveland away for it. But once the deadline passes, if you have an open roster spot, I would convert Diakite, who has been playing very, very well for the charge, but has also been... Kind of showing flashes as a more stretchier version of Lamar Stevens, but a guy who can play three through five on the floor for Cleveland, at least defend three through five on the floor for Cleveland. Reward his strong play for the first half of the season. Reward him starting for you in weird spot opportunities where you're just like, 
hit with a lot of injuries or just the flu bug that was going around earlier in December and then figure out how you can make it work and just keep Sharif Cooper within the rotation. You allow him to continue developing under Mike Garrity and then maybe next year you invite him back to training camp. You let him be on your summer league roster like he was for the Atlanta Hawks last summer. You let Cooper just kind of work in that role and stay within the Cavs development ecosystem. And then you see, hey, maybe we sign Sharif to that Kobe Alvin special and we keep him on the back end of our rotation along with Mamadi. And <clears throat> we sign a guy, let's say like Luke Travers to a two-way deal, but like obviously with the pay bump that G League guys are getting soon, maybe Travers is more intrigued to do that. And then you allow Travers to kind of take that spot and develop and grow. And then you just continue to churn out back end rotation talent. So then eventually if you're Cleveland, you could say, okay, Jetty Osman, second round pick on assignment worked for us. Dean Wade, a two-way contract worked out for us. Lamar Stevens, a two-way contract worked out for us. Isaiah Mobley, a two-way contract worked out for us. Mabadi Diakite, a two-way contract worked out for us. Look at Sharif Cooper, a possible two-way candidate worked out for us. You have Luke Travers, who is on either assignment with Cleveland after signing his rookie scale contract or on a two-way deal with the Cavs just want to keep the money clean could be another long-term developmental piece that becomes a wing depth guy and like those are seven names right there and realistically speaking the Cavs aren't going to keep all seven of those guys but that's a pretty good place to be in at the end of the day because you're properly utilizing the G League in that sense where you're developing talent for the Cavs because I remember my conversation with Cleveland Charge general manager Brendan Yu last winter around the G League Showcase Cup that the end-all be-all goal for the charge is to help the Cavs win by any means necessary and do whatever it takes to win, help the Cavs win. And by that regard, it's letting guys rehab and develop. Like in the past, Isaiah Thomas recovered from his hip injury with the charge and did a lot of practice with them. Or you have Ricky Rubio, who's been spending a lot of time practicing with them and kind of picking the brains and working with Cooper and Chandler Vodger, who could be another two-way candidate for the Cavs as well, uh, just kind of picking their brains and working with them to make them better players. Or they also just develop talent like those five guys I've already mentioned, along with possibly Sharif Cooper and Luke Travers, who could probably use some time down in the G League just to adapt to the physicality, even though the Australian League is arguably the second best basketball league in the world. But that's just kind of where they're at. And in the grand scheme of things, we'll see how the season goes for the charge overall. They did drop their regular season opener. Um, so technically speaking, the first half of the season for the charge was technically their preseason, which led to the Vegas winter showcase cup where a lot of general managers got together. They evaluated a lot of talent. There's a lot of, lot, a lot of talented players that are just on assignment. Like Peyton Watson was a first round pick by the Oklahoma city thunder who was traded to the Denver nuggets as is on assignment with grand rapids and had 29 points and nine rebounds on Tuesday night. Like he looked great and he was two or three from three and, you wonder, like, man, he'd be great on the Cavs, but unfortunately he's on a rookie skill deal with Denver. But either way, the Cavs are using the charge well. They may have dropped their first game. They may almost made it to the championship game in the G League Winter Showcase, but now they're going to be shifting their focus to finishing out the G League regular season. And then that will come playoff time. That will come a possible path to win a championship. The Charge have only made it to the championship round once, and that's when they were in Canton. And I believe Luke Herringody was on the roster at the time. But it's a very fun time. The, the Charge are just really, really good this year. Um, I think Mike Garrity just has his finger on the pulse of this club. He knows what works. He was quite frank and honest with me, and Sharif Cooper was as well after the game against Grand Rapids that. They didn't dig deep enough or play a little bit too physically against Grand Rapids, who also featured Norris Cole, which is just kind of a fun shout out as well, seeing a two-time NBA champion out there. But regardless of that, I think the Charger are in a good place. I think the layoff in between the Showcase Cup and the regular season did kind of have an effect on them, but... The charge should be very, very good this season. Um, they should go very, very far. Tickets are super cheap. They play at the Wolstein Center almost every other night or they're on the road. Like They're heading out to New York um, in the Western New York region to play the Knicks G League affiliate on December 2nd and the 3rd, or sorry, January 2nd and 3rd. And then they'll be back home again after that. So if you can, go check out the charge. Check out the feature of the Cavs. There's a lot of good dudes on there. But guys, you probably want to keep an eye on, obviously, are Diakite and Isaiah Mobley. Keep an eye on Sharif Cooper. I think Nate Hinton has some potential there too. I think DD Lauzetta has some potential as well. Rashad Vaughn, who is making another appearance with the charge, is pretty interesting too. And then Chandler Vodrin, who I wrote a feature on way back when, when Write Down Euclid launched its website, just about his path back to the NBA and how, like, when he tore his ACL in Summer League, um, the Cavs still took care of him every step of the way, even though he is not under contract and kept tabs on him during his rehab and recovery. But 
just keep an eye on the charge. Keep an eye on the Cavs. Chris and I will be back to talk about all that, that tomorrow for Thursday's show. But until then, that'll do it today for today's Locked On Cavs, the only Cleveland Cavaliers podcast in the top 200 for Apple Podcasts. So thank you again for keeping that streak alive and making it your first listen every single day. But for your second listen, make sure to check out Locked On Sports Today, the biggest sports stories around the world in 20 minutes or less. Plus, there's instant reactions, game recaps, and Locked On's take of the day. Probably seen my ugly mug on there a few times. They're available anywhere you get your podcasts, including on YouTube. If you're listening to it or watching Locked On Cavs, I guarantee you, you can find Locked On Sports Today in the same exact spot. Until next time, I'm Evan. Happy well.